Please turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 2. Our sermon text for this morning is John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Before we read that together, let's pray together one more time. Our Father, we pray that you would set our minds and hearts on the feast that is to come, uh, the wedding feast of the Lamb, as Scripture calls it, and the hope of the resurrection and of all things being made new and uh, eating and drinking with you in the kingdom. I pray that that would be our joy and our hope this morning. We pray that you would use your word to direct us to that, to glorify your son by the power of your spirit. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. John 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. Jesus did not come to bring less than forgiveness of sins, but he did come to bring more. Jesus did not come to bring less than the forgiveness of sins, but he did come to bring more. Uh, sometimes in the Christian life, we so emphasize forgiveness and justification, which are very important things, don't get me wrong, that we forget that that, that was not the end, that was not the goal of Jesus' work. Forgiveness, of course, is a great blessing, right? Psalm 32 celebrates that. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. But the blessing of forgiveness is actually one of a number of blessings in Scripture. And as central as it is, even forgiveness is actually a means to an end, the end of communion with God. Forgiveness leads to, to restoration, and restoration leads to communion and celebration. The goal of forgiveness is joy, joy in the presence of our Father in heaven. Here at the outset of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of John, Jesus performs a miracle. In John, Jesus' miracles are called signs because they point beyond themselves. And they teach us who Jesus is and something of the character of Jesus' kingdom. And Jesus' first sign is meant to show us that Jesus came to bring joy. Our outline, which you can see in your bulletin, is uh, five points. Uh, why we need joy, where we look for it, why it fails, what Jesus brings, and how we receive it. So first, why we need joy. Now, now, why we need joy isn't 
directly mentioned in our text, and it's almost too obvious to say, but I think it is important to mention, even if very briefly. I'm sure there have been times and philosophies where joy has been discounted, just as perhaps in our age it may be over-pursued. But there is something in the human soul that longs for happiness, that desires good, and that longing is right. Uh, the book of Proverbs tells us uh, what happens when joy is lacking. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 13 says, A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but by sorrow of heart the spirit is crushed. Sorrow, in contrast to joy, crushes us, the Proverbs say. Or Proverbs 17, 22, A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Right, that, that sorrow that crushes our souls affects our bodies, right? Uh, our, our physical health declines with worry and depression and anxiety and sadness. Finally, Proverbs 18, 14 says, A man's spirit will endure sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? See, lack of joy is ultimately unbearable. We were made for joy. When it is lacking, we, we tend to flounder. And joy is, is actually essential to flourishing and thriving as human beings made in God's image. That's why we need joy, right? We, we were made for it. Uh, we, we, we can be crushed without it. We need it to flourish as human beings made in the image of God. And so where do we look for it? Where do you look for joy? Uh, really, what, what makes you happy? Uh, when you are sad, where do you turn to cheer yourself up? Now, this actually does bring us into our text. Right? There, there, was a, there was a wedding in, in Cana. Jesus was there at this wedding. His disciples were there. Jesus' mother was there, and they run out of wine. Now, that was a pretty big deal uh, in uh, ancient Hebrew culture. In fact, one commentator suggested that uh, the groom could be sued by relatives of the bride for failing to fulfill his obligations for the wedding reception, which means those are people who took their parties seriously. Now, Jesus' mother mentions this lack to him, and he responds, not unkindly, but straightforwardly, woman, what does this have to do with me? Uh, now, the Greek there for woman, it, it's not an unkind title. Uh, in fact, later in the gospel, in John 19, verse 26, so pretty close to the end, uh, on the cross, Jesus, seeking to make sure his mother was cared for, entrusts her to John's care by saying, woman, behold your son. So the title, woman, is not uncaring, either in John 19 or here. Uh, though it, it may be that Jesus is drawing boundaries, right? He, he is to be about his father's work, as he points out multiple times in the Gospel of John. No one, not even his mother, must distract him from that work. Now, the question, what does this have to do with me, is pretty stark. And it's followed by what is probably the most theologically significant sentence in this story, my hour has not yet come. Jesus' hour is repeatedly mentioned in the Gospel of John, and it refers to the hour of his death and the hour of his glorification. Uh, it, it is the hour for which he came into the world and the hour when he will accomplish his work. Before John 12, Jesus repeatedly says, my hour or my time has not yet come. And from John 12 on, Jesus says, my hour has come. Right? He's ready to go to the cross. Which means here, uh, this calls us, when Jesus says these words, my hour has not yet come, this calls us to read this story in light of Jesus' larger work, not as an isolated bunny trail. Now, Mary, uh, in, in a really maybe interesting or odd response to what Jesus says, uh, ever confident, I think, in her dependable son, though probably having no clue what was about to happen, instructs the servants uh, the, the word is diakonos, by the way, from which we get the word deacon. Uh, she instructs the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
At this point, they fill six water jars, not, not small water jars, not water bottles, right? But huge jars, the ESV says 20 to 30 gallons in each jar. And, and these jars were for, for uh, Jewish purification rituals, most likely here at the wedding feast, uh, perhaps for washing of hands before the meal or even for purification before the wedding night. Jesus has them fill these jars, which means apparently they were empty at the time and then take some of the water to the master of the feast. He seems to be the kind of, a kind of MC or the event coordinator of the, the wedding feast. And he tastes the water, now become wine. And uh, so, uh, which means a real miracle has taken place. That which was water is now wine. Interestingly, John doesn't focus on the moment of change, uh, but he, he, he really mentions it now almost in passing that it had happened. Uh, and the master of the feast has no idea what happened, and so he serves really to validate the miracle as an unbiased bystander. And, and he calls the groom, whose, whose reputation was actually just saved by Jesus, and he comments on his unorthodox serving patterns. He says, most people start with the good stuff and then wait until people have drunk freely uh, and so are unable to tell the difference, and then they slip in the cheap stuff. But this groom has saved the best for last. Now, as I said earlier, this story, uh, in this story, we see uh, it, it tells us that Jesus came to bring joy. But if we look closely in the story, there are other contenders, uh, other potential sources of joy, places that people either did or could have looked. And there are at least three in the story. There, there are people and rituals and substances. Uh, first, there's the bridegroom himself. So, so D.A. Carson, the commentator I mentioned earlier, he, he says of an, uh, of an ancient Jewish wedding that a wedding celebration could last as long as a week and the financial responsibility lay with the groom. To run out of supplies would be a dreadful embarrassment in a shame culture. And there is some evidence it could also lay the groom open to a lawsuit from aggrieved relatives of the bride. Right, so everything hinged on this man. Now, if you've ever put together a wedding before, you might have felt very similar. Uh, you, you may have felt that everything hinged on you. Uh, you wanted everything to be perfect, perhaps for your son or your daughter. Uh, you, you wanted to perfect every detail. You wanted everyone to be happy. You wanted to create memories that would last a lifetime. And it felt, and it was maybe all on you. Often we look to people, don't we, to manufacture joy, whether, for, whether we look to ourselves or to our spouse or to our parents or even to our children. We want them to make us happy, right, to perform for us, to, to save us from the dangers or the confusion or the monotony of life. And we put all this pressure on them to maintain our emotional state, right? And if they fail, we may even begin to play the victim. It's all their fault after all. Sometimes we look to people Really, we're looking to people to do for us what only God can do, but we'll get to that point. But we look to people to bring us joy, to make us happy. Another possible source of joy in this text is, is, is ritual. Uh, there are these six stone water jars. They are there for ritual purification. And while there's no sense in which the people in this story look to this as a source of joy, many people do. Uh, many people look to ritual, or, or whether religious or secular, for comfort and happiness. We like our routines, don't we? Whether that is finding comfort in the church's liturgy or finding comfort in our morning coffee routine, right? We, we immerse ourselves in the daily habits of life. We seek to find our sense of well-being there. It's not that, that those routines are bad. It's that we place our satisfaction and our comfort and our happiness in them. And we prove that, uh, of course, when our routines get broken and our disposition turns sour, right? We're looking to those things for joy, for happiness, for comfort in life. Finally, in our text, of course, there's the wine, the wine that Jesus brings. I mean, Jesus brings it, right? So, so it, 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 he brings it as a, as a means of celebration at the party. So we have people, we have rituals, we have substances, all, right, things that we might look to as a source of our joy. They're all things in this life that one might look to as a means of kind of emotional stability, of avoiding sorrow and sadness that crush uh, the spirit. 
You know, I'm sad, where, where do I turn? Do I turn to people? Do I turn to activity? Do I turn to the stuff of this life? I mean, we've got to look somewhere, right? So where, where else will we find happiness except in the people and then the activity and the stuff of this life? That's all we've got, so we think. Well, let me come back to the question at the, uh, that I asked a moment ago, which is where do you look for joy? What makes you happy? Where, when, when you are sad, where do you turn? Who do you turn to? What activity do you throw yourself into? What stuff of this life do you fill your life with in order to fill the emptiness? Whatever it is, uh, of course, the next thing that we need to notice is that they all fail. So why do we need joy? Well, we, we were made for it, right? We, we can be crushed without it. We need it to flourish. Where do we look for it? Well, we often look for it in the people and in the activity and in the stuff of this life. Why does it fail? Because it does fail, doesn't it? It fails in this story uh, that the bridegroom's poor planning or limited budget, right, whatever it is, cause a small party crisis. Uh, the, the water jars stand there empty with no thought that they might become more than they are, right? Just jars for ritual purification. Uh, the wine, uh, the, the wine is a bit more interesting. But first, the bridegroom, right? Why, why does the bridegroom fail? We, we don't really know, right? Again, poor planning or, or limited budget or something else altogether, but he does fail. Why do people fail? Why do people fail to make you happy? Uh, they fail to make you happy because they are people and that's not their job. And they fail to make you happy because like you, they are sinful people, broken people, people who themselves need some source of joy other than themselves. We must look for joy outside of ourselves. We're not made to make ourselves or anyone else happy. We need to look outside. What about the water jars? You know, many people, again, throw themselves into religious ritual. I mean, we're here Sunday morning going through certain rituals, aren't we? Uh, reading scripture, singing songs, praying to our Heavenly Father, listening to God's word. Uh, I'm not saying any of that is wrong, right? Don't mishear me. In fact, these stone water jars, they're, they're part of the Mosaic law, God's law uh, given through Moses. There was certainly nothing wrong with that. But God's law through Moses was not meant to be an end in itself. That wasn't the end point. Uh, th think about it this way, right? Think, think about date night. Uh, you, you know what date night is like, right? You, you, uh, you, you take a shower, uh, you put on clean clothes, you, you shave, you, you go through, right, certain purification rituals. But that's not the end game. That's not the goal. You don't get all dressed up and then go sit on the couch. You go out on a date with someone, right? You, you go to a nice restaurant, you order a nice meal, you have a glass of wine with someone. The intimacy is the goal. And the Old Testament is, is, of course, great, right? It's important. It's God-given. The Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, the purification is great, but it's not the end goal. It's going somewhere, right? Th this miracle is a sign that, that date night is here, right? That Jesus just showed up at the door and rang the doorbell. Something more important than the Old Testament purification rituals has come. And so people, people can't be our source of joy because they, they were never intended to be, and, and we are all broken ourselves. Ritual can't be our source of joy because it was intended, uh, uh, it was never intended to be. And in fact, the Old Testament ritual was preparatory. It was preparatory for something else, something more to come. It was moving somewhere. Well, what about stuff? I mean, in this story, there's the wine. Jesus creates an abundance of wine, up to 180 gallons worth. Uh, scripture speaks about alcohol in a couple different ways, right? Primarily two, uh, you may know. On the one hand, it talks about uh, its dangers, particularly the danger of drunkenness. Alcohol can control you. If you give yourself to it, it can ruin your life. But before that, Scripture talks about its goodness. Uh, in, in a warning against false teachers who forbid eating certain foods, uh, Paul says in 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, for everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Of course, that, that might bring up a question in your mind. Well, did God create wine, right? It, Paul says, everything created by God is good. Uh, well, we, we can answer that question by going to Psalm 104, which says that God created wine 
to gladden the heart of man. Uh, the biblical purpose of alcohol, when used wisely and legally, right, uh, is to bring gladness to our hearts. In fact, in Deuteronomy 14, wine and strong drink are even used in celebrations at the temple. When used rightly and wisely, alcohol was a part of religious rituals in Israel. And so you might think, if there is anything in this life that's a source of joy, right, the, the bridegroom fails, the water jars stand empty, but Jesus brings the wine. And yet we would, we would really be missing the point of this story if we stopped there. Uh, we would be missing the point of the story if our eyes couldn't see any further than the wine. And some people will do that later in Jesus' ministry, this time not because of wine, but because of bread. They'll miss the point of the story. Uh, Jesus feeds the 5,000 in John chapter 6 with bread, and they come looking for him, and he says in John 6, 26, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. And Jesus had filled their belly, but they failed to grasp the point. The bread was nourishing, as nourishing as it was, it was meant to point to him, the bread of life. And so here, the, the wine, as great as it was for the life of that party, it was meant to point to Jesus. And that's true with all good things in this life, isn't it? They point us away from ourselves and away from themselves and to Jesus, the giver of those good gifts. The one who in himself is goodness incarnate. And so whether people or activities or the stuff of this life, none of it can satisfy because none of it was ever meant to satisfy. All of it was meant to point away from himself, from itself to something or rather some one greater. So why do we need joy? We, we were made for it, right? We, we can be crushed without it. We need it to flourish. Where do we look for it? Well, we often look for it in the wrong places, in the people and the activity and the stuff of this life. Why does it fail? Well, because the things of this life were never meant to satisfy. Uh, the great image uh, in, in Jeremiah about this is found in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, where Jeremiah or God says, uh, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You see, there, there's nothing wrong with, with people or even ritual or stuff, but none can satisfy because none were made to satisfy. They cannot satisfy because they are empty cisterns. They are not the, the source of the water of life. Well, this brings us to our fourth point then, which is what Jesus brings. Uh, first, let me point out two things about Jesus in this story, two things about his character. Uh, first, Jesus has to be asked to perform this miracle, which I think is, is characteristic of Jesus. He, he's not there to make a power play. Uh, he's not out doing flashy things to attract attention. Uh, there is a humility here in the way Jesus uses his power, as there always is. Second, that humility is further seen in the miracle itself. I mean, really, what a mundane miracle. There's no one sick, there's no one dying, there's no one diseased, no one deformed. They run out of wine at a party. And most people don't even realize it. And, and, and in fact, Jesus doesn't even get the credit that the master of the feast compliments the bridegroom, the guy who blew it. How very Jesus, right, to do something amazing and then to give the credit to others. But what is this story really all about? Uh, what makes it not just a, a rabbit trail before we get to the real uh, story of Jesus that John is telling in his gospel? Why is it so important to put right here up front as the first thing that we really see Jesus doing? What we have here is a picture of Jesus as the bridegroom providing for the wedding feast. That is, we see here that Jesus to, to came, to, came to bring joy, came to, to bring the party, to bring a celebration as the bridegroom. Uh, first, re remember that statement that he said, my hour has not yet come. What's on Jesus' mind when he says that? Well, his hour uh, in the Gospel of John, that refers to his death, refers to his coming into his glory through his death. It refers to his triumph through his death. And so he's thinking about his death and his glory and his triumph and his bride. Jesus is thinking about his bride. Why can I say that? Well, think about it. Ephesians chapter 5, 
tells us Jesus' role as our bridegroom. And it says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that is his bride, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. Jesus came to purify his bride, not with ritual, but with his blood. His hour was about to come when he would cleanse his bride, but it had not yet come. Jesus would cleanse his bride in preparation for the wedding feast of the Lamb, Revelation 7 and 19 say. That is, all of history is headed toward a wedding feast when we will be joined to Jesus. The, the scriptural imagery is really that we are his betrothed awaiting the wedding feast. And the moment Jesus says, my hour has not yet come, it brings his hour to mind and all that that will mean. And notice second, Jesus actually does fulfill the role of the bridegroom here. Uh, he does what the human bridegroom failed to do. He provides for the celebration. And he provides something better, right? The, the good wine saved for last. And that it was wine is significant, right? They didn't run out of, uh, you know, ambrosia. They ran out of wine. And in Old Testament prophecies, the abundance of wine is the sign of the coming kingdom and its fullness. We read, uh, we read a few verses about that earlier, like Amos chapter 9, which says that the mountains will drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. God's coming kingdom is a wedding feast, a celebration with wine in abundance, the prophets tell us. Now, the mountains aren't dripping with wine here, but 180 gallons at a small town wedding is at least a sign, a literal foretaste of things to come. And notice also Jesus does what the law could not do. Uh, this is a theme throughout the Gospel of John. The law was not bad, but it was not sufficient either. The law could bring ritual purification, but interestingly, these jars are empty. And I think reminding us that apart from Jesus, the Old Testament ceremonies are empty. But Jesus comes to fill them, to fill them by his life and death and resurrection, and then to transform them. The law of Moses offered ritual purification. Jesus came to bring actual celebration. And you might wonder, how does he do that? How does Jesus bring celebration? I mean, the image of wine is one thing. That's great. But what does it mean? Jesus brings joy and sins forgiven. That's true. There's even more to it than that. Jesus is the bridegroom. His church is the bride. Jesus comes to bring joy in communion with God, joy in fellowship with the creator of the universe. And yet I, I think there's still more as we meditate on this passage. This story is surrounded by the ministry of John the Baptist in chapters one and three. In John one, John the Baptist told us that Jesus would baptize with the spirit. In John 3, John the Baptist will call Jesus the bridegroom, and we will be told that Jesus gives the Spirit without measure. John baptized with water for ritual purification, but Jesus comes to fill us with the Spirit. And the wine, in some sense, is a picture of that. Uh, now, you, you may be uncomfortable with me saying that the wine is a picture of the Holy Spirit, but, but think about it just for a minute. There is something similar about the two. In fact, there's something so similar, Paul picks up on it in Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, in Ephesians 5.18, he says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit comes to fill us and to bring joy. Not the joy of drunkenness, right? but joy in the Spirit. Joy in communion with our Father. The Spirit comes to fill us and bring joy. Why joy? Because the Spirit comes to bring us Jesus, our bridegroom. We anticipate the wedding feast of the Lamb when we enter into communion with Jesus, when we will enter into a communion with Jesus that we have not yet experienced. But right now, we enjoy communion with Jesus by his spirit who dwells in us. The spirit whom Jesus is very, or whom John, throughout his gospel, is very concerned that we know Jesus is going to pour out. Jesus is going to bring his spirit. How does Jesus do that? Well, he does it through his hour, which was to come. He does it through his death for our sin. Jesus comes to taste mourning that we might know gladness. He, he comes to taste sadness that we might know joy. He, he, he does it by being abandoned by the Father at the cross, that we might know communion with the Father through him. Jesus takes our shame 
that we might get credit for his good work and be praised by the true master of the feast. And so Jesus comes to do what the bridegroom failed to do, bring the joy, bring the party. Jesus comes to do what the law of Moses could not do, bring not ritual purification, but present celebration. And he does that by dealing with our sins at his triumphant hour and then bringing actual present communion with God by his spirit. Jesus comes to bring joy and communion with God by the spirit. This, this miracle, John says, is a sign. Signs signify something. Yes, it points to Jesus' power and divinity and messiahship, but by its nature, it shows us that he is the joy bringer the one who comes to fill us with his spirit. And so why do we need joy? Well, we, we were made for it. We were crushed without it. We need it to flourish. Where do we look for it? Often we look in all the wrong places. We look to the stuff of this life. Why does it fail? Because the things of this life were never meant to satisfy. They can't satisfy. What does Jesus bring? He brings joy and communion with our Father through the Holy Spirit. Fifth, how do we receive it? You see, you might respond uh, to everything I've just said by saying, okay, wait a minute. I'm not happy. I'm a Christian. Why am I not happy? I mean, don't I have the spirit? Where's my joy? I, I believe in Jesus, and yet I don't seem to have the joy that you're talking about. That, that's a fair question. It's a, maybe a complicated question, but it's a fair question. I, I think I can at least sketch out an answer, though there are, I'm sure, other things to say. And the first thing to say is Jesus will promise us later in the Gospel of John, he will promise us trouble and tribulation. We should expect suffering and difficulty now. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. That, that is the nature of life in the present age as we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. The nature of, uh, of life in this present age is that the, the cross comes before the crown. Right? Death comes before resurrection. Suffering comes before glory. Uh, one of my sons, Andrew, was encouraging his brother, his younger brother, to clean his room the other day. And he said this. He said, you've got to clean your room before video games because the cross comes before the crown. <laughs> that, that was a win for me. <laughs> but the question for all of us is, are we still tying our happiness, are you still tying your happiness to the people and circumstances and stuff of this life? This life will inevitably fail. Not, not even because there's something wrong with it necessarily, but because it was never meant to satisfy. So are you still tying your happiness to the people and circumstances and stuff of this life, or have you set your heart on communion with the Father through Jesus by his Spirit? Now, you might think that, well, that sounds complicated, uh, but while it may take time, it's actually not that complicated. Right? Enjoyment of anyone takes time and can grow. Right? How, how do you do that? How do you grow enjoyment of a person? Well, first, you have to not give your heart to other things. Right? You, you won't grow in enjoyment of your wife if you keep giving your heart to other women. And you won't grow in your enjoyment of the, of the creator if you keep giving your heart to his creation. But as you are setting your heart on God, there are certain ways, certain things that you can do to grow your delight in him. Uh, first, you, you can spend time with him. Psalm 1611 says, in God's presence, there is fullness of joy. And while we are not yet physically in his presence, we, as we one day will be, we can draw near to him in prayer right now. And so you can spend time with your father. You can get to know him. Uh, Psalm 27, verse 4 says, One thing have I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You want to delight in God? Seek to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Where do we do that? We do that in the scriptures. We study the scriptures, we read the scriptures, why? To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord there, to ask questions, to get to know him better. You can't delight in what you don't know. Third, you can daydream about him. You know, when you fall in love, right, your mind is consumed with this person, you get distracted by them, you can't focus 
because you keep thinking about. Psalm 63, verses 5 and 6 says, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. I give your mind over to meditating on Jesus, and you will find your heart delighting in him. Fourth, you can talk about him. Again, when you fall in love, right, or even when, you, when you're excited about some new thing, it could be anything, when you're excited about some new thing, you can't stop talking about that thing. And that's what Psalm 9 says. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And are you giving your lips to God, right? Are you talking about him? Fifth, if you want to delight in the Father, give yourself to him. Serve him, right? Give not just your, your time or your mind or your heart or your words to him. Give your hands and your feet as well. Psalm 119.35 says, lead me in the path of your commandments for I delight in it. I delight in the path that God has laid out before me. The truth is, the more you serve something, you will either grow to hate it or grow to love it. And if you grow to hate it, it's because you really want to be serving something else. Set your heart on your father. Spend time with him. Get to know him. Daydream about him. Talk about him. Sing his praises and serve him. And ask the spirit to give you joy in him through those things. Because, of course, it's not mechanistic. You can't work it up in your own heart. It requires the spirit poured out by Jesus to bring us joy. So ask the spirit to give you joy as you pursue joy in your father. Now, sometimes it doesn't come. Sometimes we simply experience sadness in the present age. That's true, isn't it? Can you cling to the hope of the wedding feast? Can you remember that Jesus brings the joy and that whatever his purpose is for your trial, he is preparing you as a part of his bride for communion with himself? That is what it looks like to walk by faith to walk in hope of the wedding feast of the Lamb and the joy of things to come. Let's pray to that end. Our Father, we pray that you would give us joy by your Holy Spirit, joy in communion with you, joy in what you have done for us in Christ, joy in that you have drawn us to yourself, joy in the hope of the wedding feast of the Lamb when all things will be made new and we will sit and feast in your kingdom. Father, give us joy in those things. Help us to delight, help us to hope, help us to wait. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.